<clears throat> okay, cool. It is up and going. Um, so I did want to show you uh, a little bit about the streaming. Um, I mentioned that I've shared my uh, PowerPoints before. And um, here you can see how many people are viewing the PowerPoint right now. I told you uh, in prior weeks, I thought it was ironic that more people view this outside of class than are in the class. It's kind of a, a flip-flop of, um, of what's of education. Here we have three, six, nine, twelve students in the class. And right now there are 17 people on Earth viewing the PowerPoint slides. I, I can't track how many people are watching the video. I just don't know how to do that yet. But uh, now 19 people doing the slides, and here, what, what I count, 12. So um, it's very interesting. Um, at, up here, you see they're anonymous, um, and here we get to engage. So there is a, a, a large discussion about uh, online courses um, that are kind of taking over massive. Uh, open enrollment courses. Have you heard of these? M O O C. What do you think about those? Do you have any initial thoughts? What do you think? Good, bad. What do you think? What What are the What are the good positives? What are the bad? I would say that the good things are um, they're easily accessible for so people who can't do traditional classes. Oh, but they're not. Mm -hmm. You think they're accessible, right? Mm -hmm. But who doesn't have access to these classes? Don't have a computer or internet. Right. So they're pretty exclusive. You know, I, on the surface, someone like me at my job, I promote email use all the time. In fact, today in a leadership meeting, um, we're talking about pagers. I know a lot of you are in healthcare. We're talking about pagers. We pay forty thousand dollars a year for these pagers. I'm like, that's ridiculous. We have mobile units. You should use email. But there are two reasons for not being able to access the internet, and one is money, and the second is knowledge. So even if you gave uh, a poor person a thousand dollars and said, "We go buy a computer," they wouldn't even perhaps know how to log on. So we're trying to overcome barriers, and on a massive online open enrollment, however the acronym is, it might be really causing more of a greater divide. But you know they'll they'll preach it to you like it's uh, great access, and you think right in the name, massive open enrollment. You know we've talked about how we can't, none of us here can get into the Harvard gates, you know, but we can get into the massive online open enrollment courses at MIT or Yale. I've showed you up here. So there's this tease that you know you have access, but um, maybe they're not as accessible as we think of them. Well, tonight's not about massive open online enrollment courses. Uh, it may I might Skype in a guest if we talked about that. I know I follow an academic scholar, you know, on Twitter that's very into the subject matter. I'm not, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out there because sort of this is a massive online open enrollment course. I wouldn't call it massive, 19, it's not that massive. But it does speak to the fact of who wants the education. 
there are 19 people viewing the slides. There are thir no, 13 people here. And, you know, there are several people that have left the course. So it's who wants the education? You know, and you think about what does that education do for you? It gets you money. It gets you, you know, just general knowledge and, and creates a better society. And yet we have people right and left leaving the class. In this group, people are more likely to not go after information. But in the online anonymous group, people are more likely to go after free, open, and available communicate information. So it's a, I mean, it's, that's more philosophical sort of discussion, but I don't know. This, this is my last semester teaching um, for a long time, and uh, just to see the deaths disappear uh, is the midterm. A lot of people did not turn it in. Um, I've had a few official withdrawals, and um, it's just, oh, problem's not fixed yet, so. I won't give up until it's fixed. I told you, though, from day one, right? I told you. Just, it kills me. What are they doing? What are the people accessing this information online doing? They're trying to better themselves nonstop, 24-7. These people are going out. They're hungry for information. And these people that are not here, they are not hungry for information. They're hungry for something else. And if we have a capitalist system that uh, information helps you gain power, um, there's a divide that's being created more there. But anyways, don't get me started on that. Do not, I mean, I'm a sociology professor. That's a subject matter. So at least it's not tangential. But stick to the slides today. I'm going to do a practical application of social role theory. Um, we talked about theories, methods, uh, sample size, your population under study. Um, this sort of thing throughout the semester and you know after the midterm kind of just get a refresher of where we're at and get some footing so kind of go back to the first couple of weeks where we talked about theory I'll throw one out to you social role theory I think you'll really enjoy it and, and like it um, and I'll apply it to the healthcare field which majority I think will um, enjoy it. and um, also let you know that um, I created this because of things that happen at my work. I don't just make this up, and I think I hope that at least that you know connects with you guys. That uh, I'm not just teaching the same subject matter because it's in the book. I told you I don't like the books. I'm gonna find something in everyday life. I'm gonna bring you a lesson based on sociological principles that hopefully you can apply to your real lives. I'm looking forward. So social role theory. I'm gonna apply it to uh, healthcare. Um, it all started when I was listening to a podcast. So why this topic? Uh, again, it's a real life phenomenon. So we have our nurse here who only makes an appearance on one slide. All of the free clip art from Open Clip Art. Um, how many of you again are in healthcare? Raise your hand. Not as many as I thought. So five. Really? What do the rest of you guys do? You guys and girls that aren't healthcare. What do you guys do? Are you you could do medical social work, yeah. In business, you could be medical business. This does apply to business. In fact, one of the articles I cite for the podcast is Harvard Harvard Business Review podcast, and one of the articles is definitely organizational theory. Okay, so um, healthcare is a growing industry. Uh, like it or not, um, there are more healthcare. Uh, future workers in this class than there were 10 years ago. Uh, when I was in college, my first year, there was not a abundance of future nurses in my classes. Um, it was uh, more business. At, when I was at Western Michigan, it was more business. And we had aviation at Western. We had agriculture and horticulture at Michigan State. Uh, Michigan State's big in communications. <clears throat> I was an English major. We had pre-med, pre-dental. Um, but we didn't have this big nursing push like we do today. But it's growing, and um, I make reference to the Boston article. It's not just a growing industry, but it's a growing industry that's dominated a lot by women. Um, in this class, 100% of the healthcare future workers are women. In this class, 100% of the students are women. Um, in 
nursing. I, I think I mentioned this maybe last week that uh, my office became so female dominated that we had two bathrooms on the floor. Uh, and there's a floor that had 50 offices. And it was a male and a female bathroom, a men's and a women's. And they kept the women's. And right when, before I left, they turned the men's bathroom into unisex. So there's literally not a male bathroom anymore. There's just women's and unisex. That's how dominated it was. I should have brought a suit, but you know, not obviously. Not only are women invading the field, or you know, they're not invading. They're already there. Nurses uh, historically a uh, women dominated the field, but they're starting to make more money than men in the healthcare industry, and that's an interesting phenomenon. Um, that's pretty new, I would say, in America. There hasn't really been a field that has been dominated by women where women started to make more money than men, and that women dominated leadership in business. It's I I heard statistics. Don't quote me on this, but I, I heard it was like 11 percent of the boards of the Fortune 500 companies are women. It'll be less than that. Um, so in business as a whole, women still not very much there. Um, but in healthcare and in teaching. Uh, women are prevalent, uh, and in healthcare, the salaries are on the rise. In teaching, the salaries are not so much on the rise as you know, they cut, 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 salaries go down, down, down. You can go to a, a Flint, Saginaw, Detroit, or Lansing, you're not making anything. Um, but again, in healthcare, money's going up, salaries are going up, women are starting to take hold, get more jobs, more higher paying jobs. I told you, any of you who are going to be nurses are going to make more money than me. And I work in healthcare, so we're not comparing apples to oranges. We're comparing apples to apples. Um, they won't put me in management in healthcare because I don't have a nursing degree. So management means more money, means more advancement, means leadership, and women are going to start taking these leadership roles. And that's going to seep into the rest of the slides here. So we need to do research that fills the gaps, right? Um, the most important research topics are those that I'm seeing, and I've said this over and over, is that if you're going to tell me that crime is higher in places where there is less money, I'll say I already knew that. You know, if you're going to say uh, people go to Harvard more from rich families, I'll say I already knew that. So we need to look for um, subject matter that has not yet been um, researched. And in the nursing field, so I just told you, jobs for nurses are on the rise, salaries are on the rise. Okay, so it's been common to talk about the differences in pay scale by gender. We've heard the whole thing about the Fortune 500 boards not being women. There are no Fortune 500 CEOs. We've heard that over and over and over. And yeah, it's not fixed. We still need to fix it. It's the same thing about these empty desks. I say it over and over every semester that... At the end of the semester, there's not going to be that many people here. It still needs fixing, but it's starting to get old. So we need to look for new subject matter. <clears throat> Men overall, especially in business, tend to make more money than women. But, so I leave it off with a but. Um, <clears throat> that will pick up in a little bit. This, this is going to kind of prep you for that. We need to look at the healthcare field in this transition through a social scientific lens. Because if we just let this happen, um, there could be disaster. You can't just let an industry all of a sudden get full of women with rising salaries and think that the world's going to be great. Because with dominating forces, uh, American business run by men, you don't think that the men are going to figure this out and maybe try to just chop down the tree of healthcare so that women can't. Um, rise up and get powerful and you know become leaders and be CEOs of hospitals. So you have to at least look at this um, through a social scientific lens and first make sure it's good. I mean who knows, maybe women in power is a bad thing. Maybe it is, I don't know. You write your papers on it. Um, and if it is a good thing, if we are getting to equality, how can we sustain that or, or uh, measure its outcomes and effects and its uh, um, trends and that sort of thing. So looking through a social scientific uh, lens, Let's look at gender in healthcare. Gender. So when we talk about women and men, that's a gender issue. There will be a whole class on this. If you go to Michigan State, you could have gender issues. You know, in society, that would be a whole class. So if you look through the lens of gender and healthcare, um, you could look at the participants of healthcare, and you could look at their genders. 
So in healthcare, on a day-to-day -day basis, we have these sorts of relationships. Remember, it's, it's, sociology is, it's not just society as you think, but it's um, interpersonal relationships, it's group, it's organizations, it's institutions, you know, the various levels that you have of society. You have individual one, you have a small group, then we're part of an uh, institution, which is the school, and the school is part of a uh, nation, and the nation is part of a society or of human race, okay? So we have different levels. But on a day-to-day -day basis, the interpersonal relationships between the individuals um, are these in healthcare, okay? This is not anything new to you. Um, but I want you to look through it, through this lens, when you're saying, who are the people involved in healthcare, um, and what are their roles, okay? You want to remember that role. There's a nurse-patient relationship. There is a nurse-doctor relationship. A nurse sometimes talks to the family or cares for the family. Doctor-patient relationship. Doctor-to-doctor -doctor relationship. And doctor-to-family relationship. And I also already had doctor-to-nurse relationship. So when we're looking at this through a gender lens, well, what do you what can you tell me about some of these relationships? What are some of the first things that jump out to you when you think of that and look at that through a gendered lens, through a, through a female perspective, through a feminist perspective, through a gender perspective? What sticks out? Um, well, if, like the nurse is female, the doctor is male. Um, like they're talking to each other. If the nurse, the female nurse, wants to give the male doctor some suggestions, he might not take them or take her seriously. Oh, so um, there's some assumptions there about the knowledge that one nurse may have. Um, the male might think he know he knows them in the nurse nurse relationship. Does that ha happen in any of the other relationships where the male thinks he knows more? In all of them. Think in all of them. Mm -hmm. And so that might be true. But not only is it maybe true, but it's also your perception. And we've mm -hmm. talked about how maybe perception is reality for some people. So if I'm a male nurse and you tell me something and I just go like this and I walk away and you think, he thinks he knows more than me. But in my head, maybe I'm really thinking, that was just the best idea. But you, you have perceptions and a lot of times perceptions are reality. So this, this could be the case. Okay, what else through a gendered lens? Like with this be like, I don't know, but I think it's true. Explain. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to if you didn't. I, I guess it, it, I, it's like a maternal like instinct or just a nurturing instinct where, you know, like sometimes we have, I think, a better like rapport with clients or like a motherly or caregiver type approach where, you know, men are a little bit more logical or, you know, have like a side manner. Right? So women are often viewed as nurturing. It goes all the way back into another um, class, and I'm just like promoting the sociology department. Family and society, you know, family sociology. You have mothers, you have fathers. So if we were talking about same-sex marriage, or we were talking about just families in general, or we were talking about single father households or single mother households, there is a very common assumption, because remember, we're not talking, we're not proving anything or anything like that. But what we're talking about is perceptions right now. And there's a very common perception that that is the case. Women are more nurturing. If you took a survey, people would probably say, what, who's more nurturing? This weightlifting, bodybuilding dude with the lots of hair or this mom that has a child on her hip, right? People would see them, say the mom's more nurturing. So that would trickle down into um, these roles as well. Did you have something? Well, I, I'm just wondering, like, I noticed that the doctor never is mentioned but Right, like the nurse. Well, it, yeah, it's written up here, like nurse to doctor. Like you, you'd almost say if you were thinking about that thing, it'd be like the nurse would be going to the doctor to ask for advice because he knows everything. And from a gendered perspective, who who do we view more as nurses, and who do we view more as doctors? So from a role, you know. By definition, females are viewed as less knowledgeable and more nurturing. 
So that, that could come to play later on as well. But we could talk all day about those relationships, right? So I keep saying role, 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 and we have to remember that this uh, presentation is about social role theory. It's not an in-depth thing about social role theory. It's a practical, pragmatic presentation of social role theory. But we're talking about the roles. Within each interaction, there are two roles. Nurse, patient, nurse, doctor, nurse, family, doctor. Remember our roles. I mentioned earlier that perception is sometimes reality. And we were talking um, about an interaction between a nurse and a nurse and how I might go like this kind of and just like shake my head, whatever, and walk away. And you think that I had a certain perception. And the same, like, uh, interaction, like a nurse to nurse, like uh, talking about like an LPN versus an RN. Yeah, like by a title. Of, yeah, a lot of RNs think they know more than an LPN, but uh, one day at work, my mom actually had to show an RN how to do something that was actually her job that she should know how to do. Which my mom's an LPN. So. And that happens with doctors too. I mean, I. As a layman, you know, I just look at nurses all the same and doctors all the same. Right. Just some of them go to school for whatever different things. But um, so yeah, there's definitely a perception that if you're an LP, and I'll say it, just being in healthcare, nurses think that they're more than LPNs, and everyone thinks that they're more than age. You know, like yeah. it's just, I mean, there's schooling that backs that up, but that's about it. And then there's also the difference between an RN and a BSN, and a BSN and an MSN. Master's of Science in Nursing. Then there's a nurse practitioner, and then there's a medical doctor. And even within the medical doctor thing, MD and DO is a few different. These are all titles. The titles often define roles, right? I mean, you look at a, a chess game, and all of the pieces have different names, and they all play a different role in the chess game. You look at a basketball team, there's a center, a forward, a guard. They all have different roles. It's based on title. So in these interactions between these two roles and in the examples we've given, want to think of this, this is just some of the most fun sociology I think of Irving Goffman, um, uh, the presentation of everyday self. Irving Goffman, you know, the, all the world's a stage. These are fun things to talk about sociologically. And we um, did our field trip and, you know, I'm like, the, the whole world's our laboratory, this sort of thing. So when you look at these roles, we're looking at roles based on power, as we've talked about. Doctor and nurse, the doctor has more power than the nurse has more power than the LPN. Um, the patient, the family, who has the power. When you view these relationships, here you have actors and you have audience members. Or reworded, you have the actors and the perceivers. So, how does a nurse act when she is with a doctor? Very formal, like you kind of want to impress the doctor. You want to make sure all your ducks in a row. Can you use my oh yeah, jargon, big words, jargon. Something I tell you, you leave out from your papers. Mm -hmm. Many of you may have done this, and I'll say, omit jargon from your papers. You don't have to impress me. Think about this. You can think about it in a broad perspective. So, like a nurse will go to a doctor and use medical terminology. Sociology, just look at that and say, terminology for some, someone higher up with more power than you. To this class, you have students who are just trying to impress me with big words. It's the exact same thing across the board. That's why sociology is so fascinating. So here we have actors and we have perceivers. Actors and audience. Um, back to this. Give me another one, just any one of these relationships. Tell, tell me how somebody is an actor in this situation and someone is an audience or an audience. Because I'm a medical assistant, I'm the nurse that brings them in and I'm kind of acting out my part and asking them questions of why they're here to be seen. And I like the audience because she's listening to what I'm saying and I'm kind of acting out my part of my medical assistant role. When you're at home, do you say the same types mm -hmm. of things? Do you wear the same type of clothes? Right. You go to a job interview, you talk one way. Mm -hmm. You go, even me, on the weekends, mm -hmm. I act a little bit differently. 
I talk a little bit different. I might slur my words a little bit differently. Because <laughs> you're being you know? real. <laughs> well, I'm acting differently, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so why do you think we have to be that? Really, why does society, why do we have to be that way? Yeah. Like, really, like, somebody could that could not, like, might not be that educated, but because they don't know how to talk, their grammar, you know, their grammar in different roles, they'll be looked at like, okay, you're dumb, you really don't know what you're saying. But somebody who does know how to talk, you know, more professional, with better grammar, they're looked at like, okay, this person knows what he's talking about. Or she knows what she's talking about. So I'm glad that you asked that because that's why we have sociology classes. Mm -hmm. So now I'm happy because of my last class, you finally figured it out. Mm -hmm. This is why we have sociology classes. It's important. Otherwise, you just go through life doing all of this stuff, mm -hmm. wearing your little uniform, mm -hmm. saying the words you're supposed to say to the doctor, mm -hmm. acting, wearing these stupid clothes. Like, I don't want this. is tight. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, and I think I put on a little weight since I bought this, so it's, I don't, I mean. You're going to be like, hey, so do you have to wear a suit? I had to dress like this, you know? So you have to dress up. I mean, because, like, some people just like to wear but like, so like the college, like Delta, like it's like Well, here's the thing. Now, now we can get even into second level thought. So that's another, that's a great question. We just continue this. There are formal and informal expectations. So formally, when you're a nurse, you have to wear scrubs. Mm -hmm. And there are other informal expectations, sort of. I think language is an informal expectation, you know. Um, there, to an extent, it's formal. You can't just curse all the time. But I'm not going to, you know, when you're a nurse, some nurses, they talk with looser language, and some nurses talk with very um, proper, you know, English grammar, and neither one of them is going to get fired, or neither one of them is maybe judged to be a better or worse. It's more about the care. But they all have to wear scrubs. But I guarantee for the interview, they had to talk a certain way to get the job, right? Yeah. And, and that's where, so how I dress, do I have to wear a suit? No. But if I want, just like the interview, mm -hmm. if I want to, like, go anywhere as a professor, right. if I want to record my stuff, right. if I want to look real good, because right. this is technically my interview. Mm -hmm. I'm not tenured faculty, and I'm not where I want to be yet. No offense to Delta, no, but, like, right. I want to be at Michigan State. Right. I want to get, like, a long-term deal at uh, Saginaw Valley or something. Mm -hmm. Someone that pays a little bit better than one thousand dollars is no offense. Well, <laughs> so I can pay for my suits. Um, <laughs> I mean, like I think it's nice. Like I don't see a lot of professors not be professors. And that's another thing about my attitude, and this is how things differentiate still amongst the actors. Like. It's, that's informal. My attitude is just like dress better than, you know, dress to what you want to be, and that's going to come into play here. You know, you're going to see nurses that really, they buy the best scrubs, and they're just like, I'm going to be the, I'm going to be this. I'm going to be the part. Yeah, and, and some nurses are just like, I, I hate my job. I'm going to get the cheapest, stupidest looking scrubs and just get my paycheck. And, you know, so, yeah, it, it varies. But regardless, like, I can't come. Looking real trash. Yeah, I have to play the part, and so does each one of these. But it's now, with the issue with, like, I know, like, in nursing, like, when I think of right now, um, some of the transition right now, we have a couple meals. And I know that that's something that we talk about. Like, the male, like, a lot of the female patients don't want a male period. Mm -hmm. You know, just because it's, it's been so traditionally thought of as other you know, nurses are female. Is that like coming to the social role theory? Well, I kind of want to table that because you'll just get me going crazy about the thing in Flint where the patient said, I don't want a black nurse. Right. And I mean, I, th I look at the same thing. Nobody, I would say nobody, but less people are going to freak out if it was a gender thing. Right. I think. Um, but that's not the discussion that I would have. I and would just say. It's funny that you would say that because that's the, the approach that my nurses took because we talked about that particular you know, incident in Flint. And everybody was so appalled by it. You know, and, and like, you know, as a parent, you have the right to choose who takes care of your child. And it wasn't anything against the hospital if that's something that 
Karen said. Like that's my husband and I talked about it too because I had, I had a nurse at one point call my son pig because he couldn't eat properly, and I asked for that nurse not to be allowed near my child again. And I think she could have turned around and said that it was you know a race issue that she was Hispanic, but she realized that she said something wrong to my child, and that's why. And she realized that as a parent, I had the option of telling. You know, the hospital. I don't Which want you that do. I mean, you have a right as a parent, you know, and that's the thing is like, that that's the special review you're talking about. Is it any different when uh, an elderly female client says, like, I don't want her with his fingers, you know, because he's a male, and I don't, you know, is it that we have a big discussion about that? Is it any different than saying, you know, I don't want a uh, uh, Mexican nurse or African American Well, that is a and that's why I want to avoid it right yeah. now because yeah. that is a semester long discussion and I'll just I'll leave you just a tidbit to think of um, and this is the this is the discussion I have with my girlfriend I wish I could put it exactly how I put it with her she was like that's the most genius thing ever that you said and I'm like I'll never remember that <laughs> and I like, don't but um, if you okay so if you ask for a nurse specifically by race, that's very blatant. We all can see that. And that's when lawsuits come up. You say, I don't want a black nurse, you get a lawsuit. But as I've said in my own personal research, what's so much more dangerous, I think, than that lawsuit is when people behave in ways that will exclude races based on other factors. So, um, to use your example, if, and I can use this example because it, it doesn't make sense in the way you presented it, so I, it's a good for example. If someone calling someone else a pig was a word that was used, if pig was used all the time by males, if that was a word that males use all the time, and females don't use it, and everybody knew this, and, you, and, you, and that was what they called your child. And then you went to the nurse and you said, I don't like that, I want a different nurse. And I said, well, who, who would you pick from? You would have to pick from a group of females, because, because your choice was actually based on a gender, in my example. Mm -hmm. So what we have to be very, very careful on is avoiding any practice that is really based on race, gender, or income that disguises itself in a, in a different look. And I think I used it with um, weight, I think, with my girlfriend. Like if you say, I don't know, I, can, I wish I could remember it, but if you say you're not going to hire anybody that eats cheeseburgers, basically you're saying that you're not going to uh, hire anyone that's overweight or something like right. that. So you can't say, I'm not going to hire anybody that doesn't eat cheese, that eats cheeseburgers. Because then you're really discriminated. So you can't do that. So um, that's where it gets dangerous. But let's, we'll, we'll table that because we'll go back to this. Yeah. You say, I'm only going to hire people that have wear dresses. What am I saying? <laughs> OK, so here are your relationships and your actors and perceivers. Actors and audience. Um, from this article, perceivers have a highly elaborate set of associations concerning men and women. <laughs> the nurturing one was good because instantly when you see a female, you would think nurturing or a nurse. Instantly if you saw a male standing up, and if somebody walked by this class, and saw me, they would think that I was the professor and that you were the students. Um, I've walked by classes, my, I'm guilty of it myself. I'll walk by a class, I'll look in, and I'll see a young guy in a suit up in front of the um, class, and I'll, I'll be like, whoa, that's a pretty young professor. And it's just not thinking, uh, crossing my mind that it's actually a student. It's just automatically associate male wearing a suit up in front of a class as a professor. So there are some, um, this, says elaborate associations concerning men and women. And I think that's very much the case. <clears throat> we brought up knowledge earlier. Um, nurses are looked 
at it was less knowledgeable than doctors, but also nurses are viewed as women and doctors are viewed as men predominantly. So we can then deduce that what? that women are less knowledgeable than men. With that logic that I was saying, we look at doctors as more knowledgeable, nurse as less knowledgeable, we look at nurses as women and doctors as males, so we put two and two together, and we think that males are more knowledgeable than females. So that's what is meant by an elaborate set of associations concerning men and women. Now we're getting somewhere to, to uh, kind of the, the payoff page for the slides. There's our our actors, our roles, actors and audience in this elaborate mesh of perceptions and stereotypes, really. Okay, so um, the variables. You have gender, race, economic status, education level, and age. You know, you might want you might want an older nurse because you think she's more experienced. And that's, by definition, discriminatory. If you look at a nurse and you go, I don't want that nurse because she looks too young, wet behind the ears, and that she doesn't know that much. I want the older nurse. You're being discriminatory. But those are your uh, variables. Um, the basic ones, you know, they find a lot in uh, show class. Um, the social role theory, here's the article, suggests that women are more likely to be penalized for acting assertively. Um, and other ways that are counter to their stereotypical expectations. So let's go kind of full circle back to the second slide and what we were talking about in business, in healthcare. Who are viewed as the leaders in business by gender? It's men. And who are viewed as like the workers in healthcare? Just the women, the nurses. So, according to the social role theory, playing the part, you know, women are more likely to be penalized for acting assertively, um, and other ways that are counterproductive, or counter, counter to their stereotypical expectations. So, what does that all mean? I know that's complicated, right? What does that mean? Can anyone tell me what that means? Like if a woman acts like authoritative or stands up for herself, or she's viewed upon negative things, I think it's the same thing except for men. Like if men act emotional or sincere or viewed a bit like show those gender, like on like this manner. Yeah, I put that irony in my uh, email. I actually watched a um, documentary on a woman from I think it was China who uh, owns her own like multi-billion-dollar company. And she was actually like, disowned by her family because traditionally women aren't supposed to. They're supposed to be like leaders. Yeah. So that's kind of like how I put this. Like she got penalized because she made better life for herself than what they think she should have. Yeah. Something I never thought of um, until recently was um, some of my best friends are very successful. I have three very close friends that we email all the time, <clears throat> and I never thought about this until just these past weeks. All of my three best friends all make a lot of money. Well, the third one, he doesn't make that much money. They all make more money than me, and two of them make a lot of money. Um, and I always just was like, you know, that's their deal, they're business people, whatever. But what I'm coming to realize, it's a lot based on gender. Light, light bulbs are starting to go off in my head. All three of my friends... Their significant others, their wives, they're all married now, actually. Jeez, I'm getting old. Um, they're, all three of their wives, what do you think about their wives' um, incomes? For all three of my wealthier friends, what do you think about their wives' incomes? Less than them. And what about my income compared to my girlfriend? She makes more than me. Um... <clears throat> I don't go up the ladder in business. I've plateaued. They are all going up and up and up. Why is this? Look at the profession I'm in. I'm a teacher. This is a nurturing profession. I'm trying to like 
get you all to success. I'm caring for you. Some of you email me your personal problems. I'm trying to work as a counselor. This is a very nurture. I'm a nurturing dude. And I'm not very assertive, as some of you know. If I was assertive, I would have made you turn in your midterm on time. And I let it extend for like a whole week. I'm not very assertive. You tell me what to do. I do it. And all this sort of thing. So I'm a real passive person. So I have not exceed, succeeded in the business world. All three of them have. <clears throat> so to really sum it up, too, about the whole gender thing. Okay, my girlfriend makes more than me. Why is that? She's more like a dude than I am. <laughs> and all three of my friends, they make more than their wives. And to really just nail the nail on the head, my most wealthiest friend, I think his wife, I don't think she does anything. I think she's a homemaker. So there's a complete dominance relationship there. The second one and the third one, what do their wives do? Something fun. Who said that? They're both teachers. That's the, that is the essence of gender. Like, I mean, that's it. It just made sense because I'm a, like, I'm always sitting at my desk going, "Why haven't I made it? Why didn't? How come all my friends make so much more money?" Here's your answer right here. Women are penalized for acting assertively. Men are penalized for acting passive and nurturing. And men, and you can flip off, so you could have a, like a box. When women are assertive, they're penalized. When women are nurturing, they're boosted. Look at the nursing salaries. Women nurturing, great. Women try to be bosses, no. Men try to be assertive, like my three friends. Money, here you go. Men try to be passive, like me. Here, you can't even pay your gas for this job. So it's like... She asks, why do these things perpetuate? Why is things like this? This is how it continues to operate. Until we change something dramatically, it's going to go on forever. I mean, this is the way things are. How, you'll, how likely would it ever be for me to stand up here and go, I have three really good friends, and they're extremely wealthy, all six figures. What do you think their husbands do? Oh, let's see, probably make less money than them, and all three of their husbands are probably teachers, right? No, that's never going to happen. So it's like the more aggressive you are, the more money you're going to make, the more likely you are to have a passive wife who's a teacher. So this is just going to keep going and going because that's how it works. That's it. It's for, I mean, that's how it doesn't work. I'm going to say it works good. That's how things go right now. <clears throat> Anytime someone acts counter, so this is not just the box of squares, women passive, women aggressive, men passive, men aggressive. This is summed up here, counter to stereotypical expectations. <clears throat> what it, go ahead. You get a woman to to be from a house. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say, like, my husband's really looked down on because he's a he comes off the house bitch now because he stays home with the kids and I make all the money. Whereas normally I'd be the opposite. Like I would be the one staying at home and keep all the money. But I really sound on him now because that's not really what I'm supposed to be. There's a conflict there, right? It's just like not how it's supposed to be, right? Where's um. Do you guys, uh, who's military? Isn't somebody in here super military? Do you know anything about military rape frequency? It's insanely high. So when we're talking about people behaving counter to stereotypical expectations, what does it mean to be in the military? What do you have to do? How do you have to behave to be in the military? So what happens when a woman acts counter to what she's supposed to be? The whole balance throws off. So if you want to see a perfect example, and it's a terrible example to think of, but the worst thing that can happen is if a woman acts too assertively, what does the male do to her? Rapes her because he freaks out. I mean, let, I'm not going to say if this is natural or psychological, but this is from a sociological perspective perspective, we can just go with the data, we can say behavior X, women, acts counter to the stereotype, and resolve the rape frequency in 
the military is ridiculous. So that's sort of to convey that. Just said. What what are some other stereotypical contradictions you can think of? The cop was a good one. <clears throat> I think like for for the men too, like she was saying her husband, like I have a cousin, his wife is a pharmacist, he has a business degree for quite state time, and he stays home. And it's not probably nice, but a lot of people in our family like just constantly like jokingly like say stuff to them. Like, you know, like where you got your apron, you know, did you bake cookies? You know, did you are you going to mommy and me? You know, that kind of stuff. When you think about expectations, you know, I always talk about race and I always talk about sports. Um, if you, if, uh, and I don't want to say you, because as I noted on your midterms, you're not supposed to say you. I'm talking the second person. But um, I think it's more likely if some, a white male with racist tendency or a white female with racist tendency goes up to see a black basketball player. They'll probably look at the black basketball player and just kind of nod and watch the game. But if they met a black doctor, and there are some racial tendencies in there, racist tendencies, they might see this black doctor like, what did this guy do? As opposed to the basketball player. You see a black doctor, you're like, what did this guy do? You see a black basketball player, and it's just like, yeah, that's what it's good. So it's, you know, that anytime somebody's being counter to the stereotype, there's going to be some conflict, and that's what's terrible. It's sad. So, like, that's why I'm not going to stop till we're all equal in this earth. Sort of that's why I think sociology is the most important. I have a question for you that's way off topic. Oh, go ahead. Like, what do you think? Like, you know, like I, like you look at all these social things, and, and you realize that these classics, there are a lot of interesting things, and even like just self evaluating, like, well, like where I would say, oh, I'm not racist, I'm not this, I'm not that. You like really think about like your own thoughts. Like, what do you? What would you say is a huge, or one of the biggest like social, like step forward? Like, you know, wh where have we? Like, what, what do you think is where we progressed, like in a positive direction? As um, a society, like, in general. Sort of the biggest steps forward. Yeah, like you know, like what, what are some of the positive things? Too much of an antagonist. So I can think of a negative for everything. I was like instantly thinking about the right to vote, but then I'm like, no, still the system can manipulate. Yeah, and that's kind of like why I asked that question, because you know what I mean? Like, you, you, I would think most people would think, wow, you know, there's no slavery and there's no, like, those are huge. But really, is it just still? You know, I don't know. Oh, no, there's tons of injustices. Until everybody's free and equal. I think, <clears throat> so... It's a good question because it's not one that, you know, I have a keen answer to. I'll just tell you what I've been thinking of lately. Our um, borders, borders have really been driving me crazy lately, um, just in my thoughts. And I never really understood it. Um, I see bumper stickers that say, like, no borders, and let's eliminate all borders. And that really kick, clicked in for me. I didn't get it. I'm, I'm starting to get it now. <laughs> Anytime you put a fence around something and protect something as if it is yours, um, that's dangerous. Anytime that, so I heard something once about the Native Americans and the American settlers or whatever, <clears throat> that um, the American settlers came over and were like asking all the Native Americans, Whose land is this, or whatever? And the, and then one of the faults of the Native Americans were they're just like, this is all everyone's land, you know, have what you need. This is our land, and so then the Europeans just yeah. ravaged their stuff and took it all. And then, you know, but we need to get to the point where we look at everything as everyone's. That's why I share all my stuff. So lately, the stuff that Aaron Swartz did is, I think, pretty groundbreaking. Um, Freedom of information, giving access to everyone, to everything, I think is, is extremely important. I think, yeah, probably Aaron Swartz, the biggest thing lately. It took me a while to get to that. That's it. Aaron Swartz. Rest in peace. Poor guy. That was terrible for him. 
<clears throat> that has its built-in antagonism. You can kill themselves. Right. I don't have to create them. Social roles. We got here. Socioeconomic status. Variables. Gender, race. Financial, education, level, and age. You have your roles and your participants here in the healthcare field. Family, patient, doctor, and nurse. And the theory is based on your actor audience. You don't really have a role unless somebody tells you to or you can behave in a certain way or you perform in a way to fulfill that role. Based on this theory. Good theory. Probably going to use it some of my dissertation. I just bounce around too often. I like this one. Know your role. No, you that so you should study this theory. This whole theory is based yeah, on. Going back to the military thing. Know your role. Every single army male I've ever met, that was their favorite thing to say to the wives. Was to know their role. Oh, to the wives. Oh, so that's very gender. I'd get your straw, but I don't think you want it. <laughs> I was, if I picked it up and gave it to you and you used it, I. I would, yeah. Okay, so using my same three bubbles here with my socioeconomic status variables, I've uh, emphasized gender and the theory I just boiled it down to your actors and your perceivers. With your participants, um, you know, in any conflict theory or social role theory, Everybody doesn't just have the same role. So what I've here, here done here is separated two roles, you know, with the relationships and nurse and doctor, doctor and patient. And obviously with actors and perceivers, you need two different roles. So here I have nurse and leadership. In particular, female leadership. So what I've uh, seen recently, yes? This made me wonder, my pediatrician, is a female, a young female, and she is like the co-head of the department at Covenant. But there's another male doctor that works the floor who's actually under her, but he he seems to treat her like she doesn't know anything, even though she's over him. Is that kind of like this whole theory type thing? Yeah, and he probably sees less repercussions because of that, you know? Think of that happening the other way. There's a doc. There's a man who's lead of the floor, and the female treats him a little bit bad. Like it, we can't even. Well, know. I think even if she were to turn around and treat him bad, and say some of the things that I've seen, I've actually seen him say to her. I think if it was the opposite way, just because she's female, she kind of would get in more trouble than what he does for saying the same things to her. That's why feminism's not dead yet. This stuff all still happens. Until there's zero rape in the military, we're not done yet. But it's not just men raping women, though. Yeah. Men. And it's not just racism, it's not just gender. Yeah. I mean, it's everything. Yeah, it's, it's a bad deal. <laughs> okay, so um, what I saw recently was um, something that's really sad to me. Um, if you're in healthcare and you want to get a promotion, advance to leadership, what are you setting yourself up for? Yeah. Or at least something, you know. I mean, I'm sitting at a table where, so I hear this on the podcast, I do some research before I get to work, I sit down at the table, and I look around the table, and our chief operating officer, our chief development officer, and our HR director are women. And there's a lot of conflict in the agency right now. People are looking at leadership, and pe people meaning female nurses are looking to leadership and saying, "Our agency leadership sucks. They're terrible." And then the leadership's like, "We're not that terrible. Why do they think we're terrible?" And then I look at this theory and I go, "Why? Why does this happen? Why is this happening?" They're in an unwinnable situation, according to this theory. There's a bunch of women leaders and a bunch of women nurses, and the women nurses are looking at these women leaders, and they don't know it, but subconsciously, according to the theory, they're saying, female leaders, uh-uh, doesn't live up to my subconscious stereotype. I have a mental conflict. 
they are terrible leaders. So what's happening is, I know these, the leadership, I'm in the leadership meetings, I'm like the very lowest on the totem pole leader, um, but here I look around, I see all these great women leaders, and then they're all told by the rank and file that they suck. And I'm just thinking, why does all the nurses think that leadership is so terrible? So basically, women want to be led by men. That's like the normal instinct that nurses try to get that. Well, be careful on your wording because instinct is, I don't think, a sociological concept. I think that's more psychology. Um, patterned behavior is more sociological. So like when she was asking how is this ever going to continue or why is this like this or this sort of thing, like these are patterned behaviors. And just like slavery was eradicated, like these are behaviors that can, and I'm, I always, it's not the same obviously, but these are types of behaviors that can change or be shaped differently. Um, so as a sociologist, I would, I would say, it's not fact, but I would say, no, it's not instinct. The way I view things is these are pattern behaviors. So like learn, like, you know, what your mom would say, make these reactions wrong, Sociology is very much on the side of nurture. And uh, psychiatrists are more on the nature side, in general. And if any sociologist is watching this video, they'll be like, Gerdwood is the worst professor ever, but I'm just trying to get across him key concepts to you. So yeah, it's not an instinct, but perhaps it is an instinct, you know, we can measure that with that. That's why uh, social psychology is so intriguing, because social psychology kind of bases this thing off, okay, this is their instinct and then this is how they acted out socially, right? <clears throat> but then again, I say all the time, we don't prove anything, we don't speak in facts, we're just trying to find everything else. Maybe it totally is instinct. It'd be fun if we did research on dogs and we're like, okay, how do the male dogs act with the female dogs? And that's very anthropological. So social sciences are very multidisciplinary. You do an anthropological study, a sociology study, and a psychology study, and put it all together. I don't know. If anything is instinct, I haven't done any research on them. This is not a fact. This is not a lesson. But <clears throat> if anything is instinct, it almost gets to my border discontent, my dislike for borders is. I think, again, personal thing, I would get fired if I'm not already in my last semester. I think the desire to, <clears throat> or the dislike of difference, I would think is almost instinctual. Again, personal opinion. I don't think too many animals or humans are introduced to something opposite them and welcome it with open arms. And could we hopefully solve that socially? I would hope so. I would love it. But I think that's a main cause for what well, we talk about gender, race, age, economics, rich guy, poor guy. Tendency is they don't like each other. 100 years ago, black guy, white guy. Unfortunately to this day, black guy, white guy. Some of them don't like each other. What's, there's only this different. So that's just, yeah, that's where it's here. So I don't think it's not a, like a born instinct. Your basic instinct you're born with is to eat and breathe and survive that way. So I think the rest of it is kind of talk. We could study it, you know. You can definitely study it. You can write your paper on it. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure they do studies. I don't have any to back, you know. But um, throw some two-year-olds in her room, you know. Uh, ten boys and one girl. See how they treat the girl. See, my, my daughter is the only girl in our family. And, like, they, the other boys just don't. Like, unless they've been to school, they don't know how to act around her because she's a girl. So she just kind of gets forgotten about. I, the only thing I've just heard, I have zero citations, but I've heard that if you put a bunch of babies together and you throw in like 
they're all white babies and you throw them one black baby, they could care less. I've heard that. Which would speak to the fact that it's all learned. It's all learned. When you start putting up fences and keeping people out, you're telling them that you're different. You're do the drawing a line in the sand. Us on this side, you on that side. How does that ever help? Me? It's terrible. Sick. Okay. So, and I think I don't think that that is personal. <laughs> I think I can back. According to social role theory, then engaging in counter normative. Remember, we talk about norms. So here we are learning bigger words now. Counter normative impression management is likely to result in undesirable perceptions. And so that wraps it up. I mean, <clears throat> like I said, you dislike your boss for reasons other than you really knew. Now you know. You only dislike your boss because she's a woman in leadership. You have an instinct to dislike her. She's not adhering to the social norm. Do you have any um, last questions about this? Please remember goals, stereotypes, and counter normative impressions. How does this all happen? Why does this all happen? We have defined roles, we have pre existing stereotypes, and when people don't perform up to our stereotypes, there is a conflict. So there's another thing about sociological theories. They're not just standalone. Talk about social role theory, then all of a sudden we're talking about conflict theory. Even in my city, we have all these buildings. You stay here. That's different here. This building's for food. This building's for money. Just need to get rid of all of our borders and that. We have classes. We're all segmented into different classes. <clears throat> Back in ancient Rome, right? This guy would get up and just talk about whatever. The philosophers, Socrates, Plato. Uh, those were the days. Now you pay money to drop out. Ugh. I do not have enough time to fix the world. Okay, let's take a break and then when we come back, uh, more excitement. Uh, 10 minutes. Population under study, uh, this sort of thing throughout the semester. And, you know, after the midterm, kind of just get a refresher of where we're at and get some footing. So kind of go back to the first couple of weeks where we talked about theory. I'll throw one out to you. Social role theory, I think you'll really enjoy it and, and like it. Um, I'm going to apply it to the healthcare field, which a majority, I think, will um, enjoy. And um, also let you know that um, I created this because of things that happen at my work. I don't just make this up, and I think, I hope that at least that, you know, connects with you guys, that uh, I'm not just teaching the same subject matter because it's in the book. I told you I don't like the books. I'm going to find something in everyday life. I'm going to bring you a lesson based on sociological principles that hopefully you can apply to your real lives. I'm looking forward. So social role theory, I'm going to apply it to uh, healthcare. Um, it all started when I was listening to a podcast. So why this topic? Uh, again, it's a real life phenomenon. So we have our nurse here who only makes an appearance on one slide. All of the free clip art from Open Clip Art. Um, how many of you again are in healthcare? Raise your hand. Not as many as I thought. So five? Really? What do the rest of you guys do? Guys and girls that aren't healthcare. What do you guys do? I'm in social work and something. Are you, you could do medical social work, yeah. In business, you could be medical business. This does apply to business. In fact, one of the articles I cite 
For the podcast, it's harder to carve a business for you. We have mobile units. You should use email. But there are two reasons for not being able to access the internet. And one is money, and the second is knowledge. So even if you gave uh, a poor person $1,000 and said, we well, go buy a computer, they wouldn't even perhaps know how to log in. So we're trying to overcome barriers. And, and a massive online open enrollment, however the acronym is, it might be really causing more of a greater divide. But you know they'll, they'll preach it to you like it's uh, great access. And you think right in the name, massive open enrollment, you know, we've talked about how we can't, none of us here can get into the Harvard gates, you know, but we can get into the massive online open enrollment courses at MIT or Yale, I've showed you up here. So there's this tease that, you know, you have access, but um, maybe they're not as accessible as we think of the services. Well, tonight's not about massive open online enrollment courses. Uh, it may, I might Skype in a guest if we talked about that. I know I follow an academic scholar. You know, on Twitter, that's very into the subject matter. I'm not, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out there because sort of this is a massive online open enrollment course. I wouldn't call it massive, 19, it's not that massive. But it does speak to the fact of who wants the education. There are 19 people viewing the slides. There are thir no, 13 people here. And, you know, there are several people that have left the course. So it's who wants the education. You know, and you think about what does education do for you? It gets you money. It gets you, you know, just general knowledge and, and creates a better society. And yet we have people right and left leaving the class. In this group, people are more likely to not go after information. But in the online anonymous group, people are more likely to go after free, open, and available communicate information. So it's a, I mean, it's... That's more philosophical sort of discussion, but I don't know. This this is my last semester teaching um, for a long time, and uh, just to see the desks disappear uh, is the midterm. A lot of people did not turn it in. Um, I've had a few official withdrawals, and um, it's just oh, problems not fixed yet. So. I won't give up until it's fixed. I told you, though, from day one, right? I told you. Just, it kills me. What are they doing? What are the people accessing this information online doing? They're trying to better themselves nonstop, 24-7. These people are going out. They're hungry for information. And these people that are not here, they are not hungry for information. They're hungry for something else. And if we have a capitalist system that uh, information helps you gain power, um, there's a divide that's being created more there. But anyways, don't get me started on that. Do not, I mean, I'm a sociology professor. That's the subject matter. So at least it's not tangential. But stick to the slides today. I'm going to do a practical application of social role theory. Um, we talked about theories, methods, uh, sample size. Your pop are in the class. It's kind of a a flip-flop of, um, of what's of education. Here we have three, six, nine, twelve students in the class. And right now there are 17 people on Earth viewing the PowerPoint slides. I, I can't track how many people are watching the video. I guess I just don't know how to do that yet. But uh, now 19 people viewing the slides. And here, what, what I count, 12? So um, it's very interesting. Um, at, up here you see they're anonymous, um, and here we get to engage. So there is a, a, a large discussion about uh, online courses um, that are kind of taking over. Massive uh, open enrollment courses, have you heard of these, MOOCs? What do you think about those? Do you have any initial thoughts? What do you think? Good, bad, what do you think? What what are the what are the good positives, what are the bad? I would say that the good things are um, they're easily accessible for people who can't do traditional classes. Oh, but they're not. Mm -hmm. You think they're accessible, right? Mm -hmm. But who doesn't have access to these classes? People 
that. Right. So they're pretty exclusive. You know, I, on the surface, someone like me at my job, I promote email use all the time. In fact, today in a leadership meeting, um, we're talking about pagers. I know a lot of you are in healthcare. We're talking about pagers. We pay $40,000 a year for these pagers. I'm like, that's ridiculous. <clears throat> okay, cool. It is up and going. Um, so I did want to show you uh, a little bit about the streaming. Um, I mentioned that I've shared my uh, PowerPoints before. And um, here you can see how many people are viewing the PowerPoint right now. I told you uh, in prior weeks, I thought it was ironic that more people view this outside of class than 